Okay. Uh, uh, welcome, folks. Um, my name is Tony Leonardo. I'm a, I'm a plant ecologist with uh, with Ramble um, Engineering, and I, I uh, just want to say start off by saying thanks to um, to John uh, for the opportunity to come and and share share some of my experiences uh, with y'all. Um, it's you know the 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 purpose of this talk really is to kind of give you all some insights um, into the what it's like to work in the private sector and and, and what it entails, um, you know, translating, um, you know, what what we all know and appreciate about ecological processes into into projects and ultimately into into a career. Um, you know, I I started out a bit in the academic world, but really, um, you know, my uh, my background has since been, you know, 10 plus years out of the academic side of things. So bear with me if some of my focus isn't quite on some of the, the things you might be um, used to and seeing sort of a, a colloquium style presentation, but, but I certainly welcome any kind of questions or comments uh, you all have. Okay. And of course, on my first slide here after testing it, I'm already locked up. Let me see what's going on here. I might need to take my slides down now suddenly. Oh my gosh. There it goes. Sorry, folks. All right. Um, so the overview of this presentation is going to focus on um, projects again and really uh, try and tell you all some stories about some of the things that we've tried to do and some lessons learned along the way. And, and thankfully, where we've been able to have some. Uh, successes. And, you know, looking back um, on roughly the 15 years or so that I've been working in the private sector, um, initially as a, as a graduate student contractor, in fact, um, and then about 10 years after my doctorate, um, one of the things that I, I think I, I keep coming back to and reflecting on that time is a lot of my efforts have been in the uh, this thing of translation. Um, and, and that's really taken shape in two ways. Um, again, trying to translate ecological themes and the things that we learn in class and in, in our reading and in our, in our thought and exploration in the field, try and take those themes and translate them into, into actual practices of either ecological restoration and management. And in thinking hard on that, you know, and, and doing everything I can to put that into practice has really also comprised my, my career development, um, becoming not only better as an ecologist and an understanding of the natural world, but, but a communicator as well with, with folks um, and, and with backgrounds different than mine. And so that, that's what I, what I hope to talk to you all about today. Um, and there's kind of three ecological themes that I'm going to loosely structure this around. Um, each of these themes are related. Um, and, uh, and they're all underpinned by ecological processes, right? Succession, competition, facilitation, what have you. Um, the applicability of these different models um, that I'm going to talk about depend maybe a little bit on the setting and what the focus is. But again, they're all related. And the, and the bottom line is, and again, this relates to the community, or excuse me, the career development side of this, is that, um, you know, in order to make these models work in a way that, that you might be successful um, in your endeavors, you, you still have to know the, 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 the components, you know, in, in other words, the species, right? Whether you're a plant ecologist, an aquatic ecologist, um, what have you, animal ecologist, you know, understand as we used to say, the aught ecology and the sin ecology, those are a bit old school ecological terms, but, but I think they still apply in, um, in, the, in the point here. All right, so um, let me just jump back again. Again, translation now, and we're gonna talk, talk through these three, these three different models and, um, and how they can be put in the practice. So we'll start off with this one, uh, called the reconciliation or, or habitat analogs model. And the site I'm gonna tell you about um, where we'll explore this concept is called the Solvay Waste Beds 1 through 8 site um, in central New York. 
Now, just starting off with sort of a description of the model here to begin with, um, and then we'll, we'll quickly move into um, exploration of the project. So one of the neat things that this uh, model that was published by uh, Lundholm and Richardson provides is, is just a nice framework to facilitate thinking. And that, that thinking pertains to um, what your basis of design is gonna be in, in implementing a restoration project. All right, and so um, what this model shows here is that there's, there's four basic types of, of, um, of systems, those that are, and, and they're separated out by whether the, these systems are influenced uh, to a high degree or to a low degree by, by humans. And then along the spectrum of what they call novel to analogous and, and novel, um, in my understanding of this model pertains to, you know, these are unique combinations of species and or environmental conditions across the spectrum to um, conditions that might be considered more analogous or in other words, um, conditions that are that are in their species composition and environmental setting, relatively similar to something historical, but that but that again, through some level of human influence has been thrown off from that, from that uh, um, level of an analogousness and, and it's through the process of management, um, you know, a manager may be able to recover some um, historical patterns of um, um, ecological patterns of processes in order, in order to achieve some management goal. All right, again, what's the, what's the importance of this model in my mind? Again, it's twofold. One is that depending on which quadrant you're in, um, this might dictate to you um, what your basis of design is from a, from a restoration perspective. In other words, if you're over here on this analogous end of the spectrum, you might uh, envision some kind of ecological reference, um, reference community as your basis of design versus if you're over here on the novel end of the spectrum, you may be looking at more of an engineered type of solution because there are unique parameters and some engineering may be in, needed to be involved in order to address those particular and unique combination of parameters. Um, one of the other important things that this model, I think in this, in this work in general supports is just that despite human influence, um, you know, through some unique and creative thinking, um, all of these potential areas can, can, can have uh, value as, as conservation opportunities. Okay, so first example here, we're gonna start, why not, way up in the upper right-hand corner here, uh, a highly novel uh, situation um, where uh, high human influence as well. Um, so the, this example comes from my hometown, central New York, um, here Onondaga Lake. This is a small, uh, a small urban lake, um, about four, about a little over four miles long, a mile wide, shallow, average depth of 35 feet, um, highly urbanized drainage, okay. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the issues here, but bottom line, just from the, from the summary, is over the past roughly 15 years, a billion dollars has been spent um, trying to address some of the, um, the industrial and municipal impacts of this lake. Um, just, you know, one other point of um, consideration is that despite these, um, these major uh, impacts to the system, it's also, um, you know, a, a, just a vital natural resource in central New York, both from the, uh, from the, from the perspective of the city and um, uh, First Nations communities that, that um, are throughout central New York. Uh, all right bit of history. So um, about 20 miles to the south of Tully, a um, uh, thousand feet down on the ground, there are uh, salt deposits. These salt deposits um, were used uh, ultimately by, uh, they were mined for a variety of purposes, but um, one, one purpose was for industrial applications. Um, you know, the, the, the salt was, a, was a, a vital natural resource for this um, process called the Solvay process. And um, the, here the industries were using salt to create a soda ash, which was a, which was a key industrial uh, reagent 
uh, during the industrialization area. Okay, um, the, the soda ash operation uh, was uh, incredibly um, inefficient and created uh, uh, literally tons of waste every day, which I'll share in, in a moment. But just to give you a sense, this is all um, industrial byproduct that has been dumped in and on the shores of Onondaga Lake um, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, so what, what ended up happening from about 1881 to 1986, um, these um, uh, Solvay Process Company and then its subsidiaries in, in the future, going into the future, created about uh, 500 tons per day of that soda ash production. And for every ton of soda ash production, there was a ton of waste also created. Along the way, 25 pounds per day of mercury were dumped in the lake over that time period. Um, in parallel, um, this process going on, um, you know, was one of the um, basis, bases of economic development in Syracuse and, um, and the city grew. Um, there is a very successful industry um, in central New York as well as other places, uh, you know, around the Great Lakes, similar Rust Belt type type economies, right? Um, so there was also, of course, significant municipal wastewater impacts to Onondaga Lake as the city grew. Um, all that activity came crashing to a halt in 1986. Um, there is, uh, you know, more, uh, more economically uh, viable sources of soda ash production elsewhere in the world. Um, story that's repeated throughout the Great Lakes region, um, you know, 1400 jobs lost. Um, immediately in 1986, and then just a downward spiral of a lot of the, the key industries uh, around Syracuse. Um, of course, so uh, given the environmental impacts, the, the job losses were followed by lawsuits um, and a lot of acrimony in a, in a long time until, um, until a consent order was signed and a cleanup could begin um, in 2006. So Zooming in now, we're going to talk about one site along uh, the shores of Onondaga Lake. This was called the Solvay Waste Beds 1 through 8. And it was one of those uh, sites where the tailings from the soda ash production process were piled up. Uh, mind you that this site was also formerly the site of what's, what was called the, the or what we call now the Geddes Inland Salt Marsh. So, one of the neat things about the area is that those same salt deposits that supported the soda ash industry also supported a groundwater hydrology and groundwater chemistry um, that led to um, these, these uh, inland salt marshes occurring around the shores of Onondaga Lake, including, including uh, below what would be the, the Salve Waste Beds 1 through 8 site. That, that nod to this uh, inland salt marsh and more generally a groundwater driven um, plant community pertains to um, some of these uh, reconciliation uh, themes now that we're uh, exploring. So just file that in the back of your minds. Again, that this, this was this waste bed site, as are several others around on a Douglas Lake historically groundwater driven systems. Okay, um, so here's what the site looked like as of a few years ago. Um, Salve waste bed site here in the, in the photo on a Douglas Lake. You can see that there's been some natural successional processes that have allowed uh, vegetation to start to uh, uh, fill in a bit uh, on these soda, soda ash production deposits. I'll tell you a little more about them later in the slideshow. Um, but note that this, this shoreline area here, um, relatively low in elevation, is, is uh, still not very well vegetated at all. And the reason for that is, is because these waste beds uh, soak up uh, precipitation, and then that precipitation percolates down through the waste beds, and, the, and that leachate gets expressed, was getting expressed on the uh, on the beach area down here. This whitish color again is not sand; it's it's uh, soda ash uh, production byproduct, or as we call sulfate waste. Um, from an environmental perspective, this was an issue because not only were the salts um, uh, um, impactful to freshwater life, but there was some other uh, serious environmental concerns in terms of the, the pollution that was 
entrained in that in that leach shape. Um, as a result, one of the there were two main um, remedial measures going on here. Um, there's a groundwater collection system that kind of goes right along the edge of the shoreline here that collects the groundwater, um, expressing itself at the site both from locally through the waste beds, but then also a larger uh, uh, groundwater, uh, regional groundwater uh, flow coming underneath the beds gets, gets kind of picked up in that system. And then also along the, the toe of the beds here, there's a, there's a seepage collecting system as well. All right, so um, bottom line is that surface water and groundwater associated with the site had been uh, collected and, and treated as a part of the cleanup, right? And not only that, but because of the environmental concerns, there is a need to, a need to uh, cover these waste, waste materials, okay? So uh, my job as the ecologist was to figure out a way to restore viable habitats given, um, given those, those variety of, of remedial measures. And in, in particular, there is a requirement um, to create at least 10 acres of wetlands in this shoreline system, despite um, my just telling you that the, both the groundwater, uh, groundwater flows would not be available for wetland development, nor would um, nor would even uh, run off from the adjacent uplands because these areas hadn't been addressed yet either. Um, and yet we're, our goal was to create wetlands and also um, recognize now that again, this is a totally novel situation where this was a groundwater. These were groundwater driven wetlands historically, they're not gonna be now. Um, that's something that we had to live with in our design and understand that um, our goals and the functions of values would be different than what they were historically. Um, so this is what the system looks like when it starts to go in, the, the, what the groundwater system looks like. We're down on the shore now of Onondaga Lake and Wastewoods 1 through 8. And you can see, um, you can see kind of what, the, what that groundwater uh, collection system looks like. Not a, not a very clean operation, but required. Um, just close up view of the shoreline here. I'm gonna kind of keep going quickly, folks, so I make sure I cover everything. There's a considerable amount of design and thought goes into um, what you're seeing here. This is the, one of the wetland basins um, that's been built on top of the remediation and groundwater system. And in essence, this wetland was designed to function like a green roof. Um, and in fact, um, was designed to function only on precipitation. Typically, you might think of bogs as being wetlands that are that um, function only based on precipitation. This was a, a lakeshore marsh that um, had the hydrology of a bog, basically. Um, again, designed to function just on precipitation. That could work here in this environment because, as is, um, you know, kind of throughout the eastern Great Lakes region, Great Lakes region especially, we have a tremendous amount. Uh, uh, more uh, precipitation on an annual basis than, ev than evapotranspiration capacity. So we're able to um, create an impermeable liner and uh, the hydrology works out favorably. Um, one year after construction, um, this is what the, the shoreline looked like after again um, designing the, the soil profile um, plant communities here and um, in all the grading plans. And again, I'd be happy to talk more in detail about that if, if students are interested. One of the, one of the ways to, to add important value here, again, recognizing that we're creating a totally novel situation on the shoreline, surface water driven wetlands, precipitation water, precipitation driven wetlands in lieu of groundwater features, um, is to try and add uh, tremendous, you know, as much um, habitat diversity if possible. And, and this is not very complicated, but it becomes complicated when you have to translate it in the contractual language. Logs, sticks, rock piles, appropriate grade, appropriate planting densities, all those things. Getting all those details right um, takes a lot, of, a lot of consideration. But it, it, it's incredible um, to watch the uh, these in, incredibly um, Modified sites change 
right after after so here we are the first winter after after restoration um we're seeing a uh, coyotes and white-tailed deer um already come back to the site um and what's what's the, the, these are these are two of my favorite photos from uh from i think the 15 years of of work I've been fortunate enough to do is, is here we are on the shore of, again, uh, waste beds one through eight. Um, we've got some switchgrass growing here in the foreground and um, and a coyote eyeballing uh, a deer here as it's a uh, quarry. And, um, and despite, you know, the hundred years of history, the city in the background, all the work that's gone on, you know, all that really, all that, these two uh, animals seem to care about is one catching the other. Um, pretty cool. Some other uh, features of the site, again, illustrating this notion of, of, uh, of novel conditions. Uh, this is a bluff that, that was uh, on, the, on the shore of um, Onondaga Lake. Uh, that's, again, that's not um, sand or, or uh, glacial till. That is a, um, that's, that's um, soda ash uh, byproduct. Um, and so in order to inhibit this, that waste material from sloughing into the um, into the lake, you can see we've uh, put in uh, the stone materials and then tried to plant uh, live stakes through that stone in order to um, help to create habitat value along the way. And there are just several other examples um, from the site, again, trying to work with novel, novel conditions to create habitat values. So a parking area, parking area is a tremendous amount of space. Um, you know, what can we do to uh, create grassland conditions? We use this uh, material called structural fill. The stone, it's a stone and soil mix uh, can be parked on and also support grassland vegetation. We have bubble links uh, hanging out up here at the top of the, at the top of the waste beds now. Um, some other sites, some other portions of the site here, we've uh, tried to envision them as, as Elvar grasslands. I'll tell you more about them in a minute. And, um, and through some different trials of, of plant, planting and seeding orga organic matter additions to the site, kind of dial in, um, you know, understanding the physical versus biological constraints on, on natural recovery here at the site and, and have since implemented a, a program again, to, to help uh, provide both a, a cover that's, that's protective from an environmental perspective, but also habitat values. All right, move on here. I'm gonna keep moving quickly because we got a lot to cover. Um, I look forward to hearing some questions. All right, let's jump over. We're gonna stay on the Solvay waste beds, a different waste bed site, but I'm gonna tell you about a different model and kind of how it's influenced our thinking um, in a, in, a, in a slightly different situation. Um, and I'm going to tie this back to the, the Lundholm and Richardson model and suggest that even though we're on a waste bed, we're, this is a different setting and we're in a different quadrant now. We're, and we're not over in what I'm going to call the novel side of it because this, this setting that we're going to go to doesn't have some of that, the, the presence of toxic substances um, that we had over on waste beds one through eight, a slightly different situation than I'm going to call in the analogous, and I'll try and explain why in, uh, as we go. Um, but before we do that, here, here's another model that um, that has influenced our, our thinking um, as we approach this site. Um, this is a centrifugal model by Wishu and Ketty from the early 90s. Um, and the way this model breaks down is that um, the authors here suggest that plant communities um, are organized such that there are these things called inclusive fundamental niches. Basically that um, uh, this uh, range of environmental conditions is inclusive um, at some relatively tolerable end of that range, uh, we call it the core habitat, where basically all species can persist. It's relatively um, you know, easy growing conditions, if you will, uh, not a lot of disturbance, Soil is fertile. Uh, there's not physical, chemical stresses that would exclude species um, in this world, uh, in this core habit that's inclusive. And then, as you proceed um, 
To the right here under uh, greater and greater environmental stresses, um, you'll see that those inclusive niches drop off um, as, you, as, you, again, as you move to the right. In reality, what, what you'll see is these, uh, what are called realized niches where I'm gonna, as some, as a result of a combination between both um, tolerance of environmental stresses and competitive exclusion, those inclusive niches are reduced down in their, in their extent um, uh, in, in the world. Now, um, one of the important things to recognize, of course, is that, is that you know, species A through F here, um, you know, they include, they, they're subject to trade-offs as they, as they become tolerant of stresses. So and it's typically, again, as you, as you have species that are relatively tolerant of stress, they become um, relatively uh, intolerant in their competitive ability. What that results in in the environment, again, is, is um, if you think about there being maybe a, a variety of different stresses out there um, versus the core habitat, as you end up with all these different unique um, environmental conditions and plant communities that, that go along with them. Again, in these, these sort of ex outer areas, you know, as, as Wishu and Keddy call them, these are um, quote unquote peripheral habitats. Of course, people make a lot of peripheral habitats too. That's part of the point of that uh, Lundholm and Richardson um, paper. Here's just an example again of an extensive uh, iron mine in the, in the northern tier of New York State. Um, a unique, I, I didn't talk about it in this project, but um, or this presentation, but this uh, former iron mine site has hundreds of acres now of uh, spymeranthes orchids growing in some of the um, some of the uh, the lower portions that have that have accumulated water. So really interesting natural processes, natural recovery going on at this site. Now, oftentimes um, in working with these uh, peripheral habitats, um, uh, for one reason or another, there may be a need to to push uh, things along more quickly, right? Um, to try and achieve a project either driven by regulatory requirement. Or, or people trying to just um, do some good on the landscape and recover, um, you know, areas impacted by people. Well, here, here's one of I think the things that the the Lund Holman Richardson model uh, gets at, as well as uh, the centrifugal model, is that these peripheral habitats, again, they they're valuable conservation opportunities. So, starting on the left hand side of the screen, people often make situations with uh, create situations with poor soil, poorly drained, infertile, um, you know, uh, loss of canopy cover. Well, there are these things throughout the Great Lakes region called Alvar grasslands. They're globally threatened and endangered in New York in particular. Um, they occur on thin, uh, droughty soils, but these situations, because of their poor drainage over bedrock, are often flooded in the, in the springtime as well. So really, um, uh, unique peripheral habitat type, but you know what? Maybe there's some value in, in understanding what's going on there from solving uh, messes and, and problems that, that people create. Um, shifting, uh, shifting infertile sands. Gosh, that reminds me of some of the situations I've seen in, um, in, uh, in uh, um, uh, gravel beds and things of that nature. And you know what? Are there things that can be learned and applied from great, our Great Lakes dune communities? Um, and then thinking more on the solve waste tailings material. You know, this is, as I'm going to tell you about, very um, a poorly drained saline, alkaline, and fertile. Well, you know what? You know, again, throughout the Great Lakes, there are natural community types that are, uh, that hold some of the clues for how we address these areas. Um, marl fens and inland salt marshes in particular. So that waste product that I, that I was telling you about, it was again, about uh, one ton of solve waste um, was generated from the soda ash production by Onondaga Lake for every ton of, of again, soda ash production itself for over a hundred years, 24 seven. And here's what that waste product looked like from a chemical perspective. You know, we got things like calcium carbonate, um, again, again, forms of calcium silicate, magnesium hydroxide, sodium chloride, so 
again, we're talking about salts of calcium, magnesium, and, and sodium. And I was just telling you about these things called marl sands and inland salt marshes, both um, rare um, plant communities, but also uh, marl sands occur on these, these soils, uh, or marl in particular, again, high in calcium. And then inland salt marshes, you know, again, a saline natural plant community type. Okay, so the Solvay Waste Bed site that I'm going to tell you about next is, is, uh, is slightly inland from Waste Beds 1 through 8. These were slightly newer waste beds. One of the important things to take home here is that over time, um, there was the, the, these, these beds became slightly quote unquote cleaner from a chemical perspective. These, were, these didn't have some of the same environmental concerns um, as the shoreline beds with the exception that again, they were highly alkaline and still highly, highly saline. And so they, they generate um, a very brackish leachate because these were uncovered. These are uncovered systems. And, um, and the, the, as the rain hits these, they, they per, it percolates through and creates this again, highly um, brackish and, and also alkaline leachate. Um, here's what this material looks like in practice. Um, you know, so this is again, more of that waste product about, has a pH typically of seven up to nine. In some cases it can be high as 11, very low total nitrogen. So a total nitrogen of under 0.3%, just to put that in perspective, that's like um, about as, uh, that's less, that's basically less nitrogen than what you'd find in, in like wood. Okay, so very low uh, fertility levels, high water holding capacity, limited bearing capacity. And I, I love this photo. This is um, one of my colleagues, Tim Volk and his graduate student here. Um, they're both very unhappy as you can understand why they've buried the tractor in the solvay waste. Um, and, uh, and you know, they, they don't have a good day ahead of them. But again, that the solve waste, whether we're calling it a peripheral habitat in, in terms of uh, Keddie's kind of dialect or a habitat analog, um, again, one way or another, um, these infertile, uh, stressful conditions are, are a conservation opportunity, again, stemming back to this notion of, um, of these rare uh, communities occurring under these um, uh, unique environmental conditions. All right. so. Here's just a, a graphic to, to try and give you a sense of what's going on at the Solvay Waste Beds uh, 12 through 15 sites. Again, different than the shoreline site. Um, these large waste piles are, were historically uncovered and unlined. And so as precipitation falls, uh, that precipitation would, would leach through and, and again, carry contaminants to the groundwater. Um, at this site, that particular concern was, was salt um, so, the, so the main uh, goal here was to just come up with a cover system that would, that would inhibit that infiltration. Now, if we were to use a traditional cover, namely something that might be like on a typical landfill um, where we'd put you know, a few feet of soil, um, that would have required about 3 million cubic yards of soil to cover this extensive 600 acre site. Um, just to give you a sense of how much 3 million cubic yards is, that's about one football field, uh, 1,600 feet deep um, in terms of depths of soil. So a tremendous amount of material would have been required to cover these uh, waste beds with a, um, with a, uh, um, a traditional type approach. Um, in working with our colleagues in the regulatory field, uh, we were able to establish um, uh, a green cover system that didn't require that tremendous use of, of earthen materials. Um, that approach entailed uh, a willow-based cover system where the willow was growing in, in uh, an amended solvay waste. That's a whole nother story um, that my colleague Tim there, who I showed a photo of, he spent the past 15 years of his career working on the willow cover system. Uh, my focus here is on our, our wetland component of that cover system. These are portions of the site that were poorly drained and were too wet for the willow to grow. But again, in thinking with that, uh, both uh, some of the lessons from the centrifugal model and the, um, the habitat analogs model, which was 
you know what, let's work with the conditions of the site as they are to the extent possible. Um, we'll introduce um, not only a wetland plant community given the poor drainage here, but, but um, marl fen and inland salt marsh species given the, the concerns over the, um, the alkalinity and the, and the salinity encountered at this site. So um, with that approach in mind, here's what it looked like in 2008. Um, again, just to give you a sense, this is what it looked like when we started. Um, this is what it looked like in August of 2008 after, um, after we got done planning it. This was chapter five of my, of my dissertation at, at SUNY ESF, if folks are interested. So um, this was some work I did as a contractor back during my doctorate. Um, and uh, um, this particular area here in the foreground, the, the, the waste material had a pH of 11.5. Um, when we started, that was a little scary. Um, but through some minimal modifications of the site, uh, just some basic agricultural amendments. Um, again, we didn't want to alleviate the stresses too much because then that would create it more of a core habitat and uh, allow for the, um, over the long term for this, the, the more unique communities to persist. Um, so again, 2008, we just got done planting mostly inland salt marsh marl fen, but we did also have some elvar and, and dune species, in fact, as well in some trial areas. Um, two years later, this is what the site looked like. You can imagine, by the way, that um, I had clients come out, um, both the, the engineer for the site and the owner of the site came out in 2008. They took one look at it and they were like, they thought I was crazy. Um, there were some choice words exchanged um, because you can imagine that um, folks who don't have it um, maybe understand what they're looking at um, um, were, were concerned. Um, the thing that was incredibly encouraging and where the confusion lies is that here we have a, a site that has a pH of 11 and a half and there's only one plant died over about, we put in about 50,000 plants. Now there, was, there were others that we lost throughout the site, but um, there's a lot of green plants here and, and plants are actually getting established. And um, so, you know, we had a sense that this is the direction that we would, we would end up at. Um, so just, uh, again, a tremendous conservation impact here. I'll just um, read those and we'll keep, keep moving along in the interest of time. Some example species from the site. I'm going to skip this to keep moving here. I want to make sure I have really plenty of time. All right. Um, the third model that um, that I'm going to talk about is called the, the stair step model, or it's uh, Steve Wise, and it's from um, 99. I think that was even adapted from something before him. Um, we're being roughly the same quad, quadrant of the, uh, of the stair, uh, excuse me, of uh, Lundholm's work. Um, on more of an, the analogous side of it, we're going to be focusing on modifying the physical environment. And that's really one of the values about, about the, the Wisenant model is it, is it, it basically says, look, um, ecosystems, fully functional, un, unimpacted ecosystems um, are generally in the zero to one category here. And as degradation occurs, it goes down through the stair step process two, three, and four. In order to um, affect recovery back up to your zero or one. Um, there's two basic um, thresholds, right? That recovery is um, initially um, inhibited by abiotic limitations and transition up from three to two requires um, modification of the abiotic limitations. And then in order to transition from two up to zero or one um, further uh, passing of thresholds entails um, uh, biotic interactions. Now, now we know that in practice things are more complicated than that, and that um, the, both in, in you know in how you approach a project and um, what goes on in terms of species um, or eco ecological interactions on the site. But this high level approach has has proven to be really valuable to me and just help organize thinking. Okay, so we're going to talk a few examples here about um, passing this uh, abiotic uh, transition threshold. 
Um, so we're going to start over on the uh, um, uh, upper portion of the Niagara River on the eastern side of Grand Island. This is called the, the Spicer Creek Wildlife Management Refuge. One of the important things to recognize here is that it's on the inside bend of a major river that was historically sheltered and allowed for you know, the deposition of sediment. Um, in, that de in that depositional area, um, there were historically, to the extent that we've been able to evaluate, um, wetlands along um, this entire reach. And we've uh, think that at least, you know, four acres, but more importantly, well over a half a mile of, of, um, of shoreline fringing wetland that's really critical for um, to act as sort of a conduit of habitat along the river at river's edge has been lost. Um, at this point now, this 5% of the East Grand Island Eastern shoreline is, is a major component. It's one of the only natural uh, shorelines left on, on the entire of Grand Island. What seems to be causing this uh, wet, historical wetland loss? Been a few things we can't control in terms of physical conditions, namely a modified water level regime and a modified sediment regime that you know we've lost the coarse sediment flux that we had historically, and there's been a, an increase in fine sediment. Uh, and then, of course, something that we we are hoping to address, as you'll see in this project, is the boat traffic. Okay. Keep going here. Okay, I've, I've um, discussed several of these points here, so I'll kind of keep moving through. One of the, um, again, important take homes is that what's going on here is that the water level management of the upper Niagara River has caused um, both a, a stabilization over the long term, but then on the, within, uh, within there's a short term uh, daily fluctuation of about a half a foot to a foot. And so what's happened is that across that daily fluctuation in water levels, um, as waves break, it kind of creates a surf, surf zone that is inhibited now with the lost wetlands from continuing uh, being able to recover naturally. And these photos kind of illustrate that. This um, surf zone is right in here um, where, you know, early in the day, water's back here, um, but then at night, time waters are drawn down and waves are breaking all throughout this, um, again, this surf zone that's, that's kind of inhibited natural processes of wetland recovery. And then, uh, then as I mentioned before, here's just some examples of the fine sediment moving through the system now and coating the plants and creating a, a suboptimal substrate for growth as well. Um, we've approached this project by designing a, a break, segmented breakwater system, primarily focused on on um, attenuating the, the boat traffic waves and then providing habitat benefits as well. Um, several considerations that go into this design. Again, I'd be happy to talk about them in the interest of time. I'm gonna keep moving. Ultimately, we've opted to uh, align this breakwater about midway out on that shelf in order to um, avoid it uh, basically from uh, breaking off um, and, and falling entirely into the river, which would have been a waste of a million dollars. Just jump down. So this is what it looks like in practice. Um, there's a few key features here. Um, just a single stones kind of placed here to try and both attenuate waves, but, but uh, not impact flow out of Spicer Creek and sediment flux down the shoreline. Uh, copious use of, of woody debris to again attenuate waves but also provide habitat and then um, just a few examples of that here and then again here's the the, the, the main portion of the segmented breakwater designed to attenuate waves but not uh, create stagnant conditions. Okay I'm just going to share a few remarks on just one last example of again a uh, um, approaching uh, changes to the, to the physical environment and then allowing natural processes to take shape. Um, this is a different uh, soda ash settling basin site in Ontario, but similar in conditions otherwise to the ones I told you about in Syracuse. Um, here, the, the main thing was again, trying to cover the site 
Um, when I was brought into the project, they were considering a geomembrane cover, which uh, would have a tremendous environmental impact in and of itself, but also a uh, tremendous cost. Um, upon visiting the site, um, you start to see some old friends. This is a uh, seaside goldenrod, foxtail barley, alkali grass. These are uh, um, all uh, uh, species of, of value from, uh, from native um, saline systems. And, um, and it starts to tell you about the site that, you know what, um, you know, species can clearly disperse here. They've made it here on their own, but there's really just environmental conditions that that need to be modified to allow these species to um, to uh, grow and, and cover the site themselves. So with that basic approach in mind, um, there was a, um, a hydro seed type application that developed for here. We, we did include some various uh, species uh, to seed as well, just to help speed things along. Um, there's a lot that can be talked about with that seed mix, which if folks are interested, I can talk more, but suffice to say, um, in 2011, we started hydro seeding small patches, just like the other story, you know, some really modest growth to begin with. Um, but then we learned some ways to actually get onto the site. Um, these tailings um, have killed people before by falling into them, by the way. Um, so there were uh, real challenges just with getting on this material. Um, but then over time, started to scale up, uh, learning more and more about modifying the physical environment. Um, and in allowing, as we call vegetation to build, build its own cover in place. And so here's a lot of the alkali grass coming in, but there's other, other cool species as well. In order to, you know, hasten some of the amelioration of physical conditions, uh, some of the engineers decided to do some questionable channeling on the site. We'll talk a little more about that. Um, again, I wanna leave time for questions, so I'll, I'll keep kind of moving along. Bottom line is that by, by taking those initial clues of what species were there um, and understanding that um, it was just sim simply some modifications of the physical environment, we were able to save a ton of environmental impact, um, but also and also cost for the owner of the site to, um, to come up with a natural approach to, to covering the system. Um, you can see, you know, there's still, still work to be done to, to um, address some of these areas with very high magnesium levels, but um, but in 10 years, um, a lot of, lot of recovery has been able to, to take shape. All right, a few concluding remarks and I apologize for um, taking too long. Um, you know, anthropogenic environments uh, can certainly be valuable sites for conservation. Um, and something that's not new is, is learning from nature and, and, and letting it be a guide. Um, you know, the challenge is in translating what we learn from nature and how to put it into action. Um, and that was the intent of the slideshow. Again, just to give you a summary, look at some of what those examples are, and we can certainly talk more about it. Um, again, bottom line is that as you're in, you know, going through your uh, courses right now and spending time outside learning, um, I, I can't underscore enough that from a career perspective, knowing your species, knowing your ecological processes and how they work together um, is vital. And then the, the, the third key piece is being able to, um, and caring, um, particularly caring about actually, you know, communicating that effectively to your, to your colleagues. All right, with that, um, I'm sorry I went long, but happy to stay as long as needed to, to discuss. And John, Kyle, I'm not sure if I, if, um, okay. I assume, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned how you were contracting getting your uh, doctorate to work on that. I'm, I'm, can, you, can you speak up just a little bit? I'm having trouble hearing. You had mentioned that when you were getting your doctorate, you were working as a contractor, uh, working to restore and rehabilitate these areas. And I was just wondering, is that the only way people approach you to do this? I guess I was just confused about how these projects came to be in the first place and what type of, I don't want to say customers, but like what type yeah. of clients are likely to initiate these endeavors? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so 
Um, the, all of the Onondaga Lake work that I talked about, including the work I started off as a grad student, um, that the, the, the basis for that all started with that consent order that I mentioned. So in, what was it, 1996 or 98, um, a federal judge said to Honeywell, you got to clean up this mess. Um, you didn't make it, you bought the companies that made it, but now it's your responsibility. Um, and so it was Honeywell's responsibility to address um, this mess that was made. Now, um, that included all the, the bunch of dredging and stuff in the lake that I didn't talk about, but also included dealing with the wetland creation and how to, how to create habitat after, um, after they cleaned up the environmental aspects of the project. Um, and so I was fortunate in that at the time I was just finishing my master's work at SUNY SUNY ESF, it's a state university in New York, um, College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse. Um, and the um, local engineering company working for Honeywell um, was called O'Brien and Gear. Um, um, they, were, they were approached, um, O'Brien and Gear and Honeywell approached my major professor, Don Leopold, and, um, and said, hey, you know, we're kind of wondering about native species and native plants on, um, you know, on our, on our sites, can you come out and do some experiments? And so that was, that was 2005. Um, and, um, and so, you know, within the, we did some very initial pilot studies, just trial plantings, um, classical kind of ecological studies, um, uh, common garden studies, things like that. And that ultimately grew into learning about um, and thinking creatively about the site. Um, and that again grew into that 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 project that I showed you the photo of that was a five acre um, restoration project that um, you know Honeywell and O'Brien and Gear hired my my major professor Don and I to to kind of implement the restoration project through SUNY ESF. Um, that that experience grew into um, O'Brien and Gear hiring me as when I got my doctorate. They were um, O'Brien Gear was then bought by Ramble, so that's that's why I'm, the company's Ramble now. But um, the other the other sites you talked about, or the, just to um, give you a sense, um, um, the Spicer Creek project, the one in Niagara River. That's um, the the client there. Um, the customer was uh, the the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and they do it. They do a ton of work through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So that's probably a program that, that John and, and maybe others here are familiar with. Uh, you know, GLRI funds a ton of work throughout the Great Lakes region. Um, the, they had funded, um, DEC got funding through GLRI. And, um, and then I had an existing relationship with, with them through some other just habitat work we had done. And, uh, and we were able to, to design and build that project for them. Um, so when you're restoring these uh, ecosystems and whatnot, I was curious, is it better to try to eliminate any non-native species that may be in the area or, and then replace them with native specimens? Or, or do these non-native species not necessarily have as much of an impact on the ecosystem itself? Yeah. Um, and sorry, I'm kind of like putting my ear right down by the speaker. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the, so I'll tell you a lesson learned from um, from the from the waste bed site is um, the the inland salt marsh restoration project. Where um, bottom line answer to your question is yes. Every every opportunity you can to eliminate invasive species before you start, you do that because once they're mixed in um, with everything you're trying to um, do, it becomes a real problem. But if you can if you can remove them beforehand, then then absolutely do it. Um, one of the mistakes that I made um, on that inland salt marsh project of the waste beds was that um, I can go back here and maybe sh uh, show some photos, but there was Phragmites around the edges of that site. And the contractor there who was doing the, the earthwork, kind of moving some things around for us, um, had a spoils pile. Um, so if you look back here, these are stands of Phragmites. And, um, 
and they they were doing a little bit of earthwork to create some microtopography for us. And the the contractor, unbeknownst to me, was taking um, solvay waste with Phragmites and trained in it and using it to build a hummocks and things like that and other elevated features on our on our site. Of course, that created a major problem because then it was just brought and spread throughout our project and we put our plants in and then we had to deal with it. So if you look, look here, you might see a few sprigs of Phragmites here and there. And it's extremely labor intensive at that point to go in and try and get that back out. So absolutely try and remove it from the get go. I mean, that's my answer is assuming that that one of the intents of the, of the project is to is to create a plant community that's um, somewhat based on a, on a, a natural native reference community. If you're in a situation where um, you know, in invasive, non-native or invasive species are more a more acceptable part, and real realistically, sometimes it is. Then, you know, maybe you don't. You just it's, it depends on the goals. Good question, though. Both.